Hello everyone and welcome to this class. I'm Jaira Sotana. I'm glad to be part of the SWB program. And I shall be taking you through a topic called statistical inference. We shall learn a lot in this class. So welcome, welcome. So we know very well that statistical analysis has two parts, two parts in statistical analysis. And these areas are statistical, descriptive statistics, and inferential statistics. Under descriptive statistics, this area is where we describe what the data entails. So for example, you have been given a certain type of data. In that data, you can be able to get mean, the median, the mode, the maximum, the minimum, the range. So you can see that it's just describing the data. That's what we call descriptive statistics. So under area of statistical anal analysis, is inferential statistics, which is the topic that we are going to cover. So in the inferential statistics, this allows us to make conclusion beyond the data which you have. So when you make conclusion of the data in regards to the population that you have drawn, we call that one inferential statistics. So in this course, you are going to learn about inferential statistics in econometrics. This topic of inferential statistics, I will cover it in two areas or in two topics. In a first area, we're going to discuss about introduction part, the introduction to inferential statistics, where we should be able to know what is inferential statistics or what is inference, for example. Then we shall also be able to discuss or to show the differences between population and statistic. So what is a population and what is a statistic? That's we're gonna discuss also. Then parameter estimation. So at the end of the class, you should be able to know what is a parameter then how you can estimate it. We shall also discuss about random sampling, the types, the various types of random sampling. And we're gonna discuss also finite and large sample properties. Finite and large sample properties. Then the next lesson we shall cover it in terms of discussing the approaches to parameter estimation, defining and testing hypotheses. What is a hypothesis? When you say the null or the alternative hypothesis, we shall also talk about that. And the errors, various errors which you can make when you are formulating hypothesis. We shall also discuss about that. Then the power of a test, power of a test, calculating power of a test. Also interval estimation, we shall also talk about that. Then we shall wrap, we shall wrap our statistical inference lesson by talking about the confidence interval, the confidence interval. So let us talk about inferential statistics. So what is an inference? Like we've talked about in our overview part, inference a process of drawing conclusion about a population parameter based on the sample that you have taken. That is inference. So inference, you make conclusion, drawing conclusion about a population parameter based on the sample that you have taken. We, another term you should be aware of is a population. What do you mean when we, when we talk about population? We shall be talking about this term till the end of this topic and mostly we'll learn about it even in other areas of statistics. So a population refers to the whole group that you are carrying out a study so that you can make a conclusion from it. 
that is a population, a whole, a whole group, a whole group under study. That is a population. In terms of population, you should be aware of finite, finite population. Finite population refers to countable or measurable uh, measurable population, or you can count them, you can measure. That's what we mean when we talk about finite population. For example, the number of students in a particular college, you can count them. That will fall under po finite population. Also, the number of teachers in a particular school, number of teachers in a particular school, those fall under finite also, finite population. In finite population, I think you, uh, in finite population means you cannot count uh, unmeasurable. In finite population where uh, uh, means uncountable or unmeasurable, you cannot be able to know the exact number, the exact number uh, of the, uh, the group that you, it is under study that will fall under in finite, finite population. Another term we should be aware of is a sample. What do we mean when we talk about a sample? A sample is a specific group of the population where data is collected from, or a representative portion of the population. That is a sample. For example, when you are carrying out a study on a number of students in a particular college, Depending on the type of study, you won't be able to collect all the data from every student. You will take a group or a specific number from that uh, college. So that number we'll take from that college is what we call a sample. That is a representative portion of the population, which is the number of, uh, number of students in a particular college that you are studying. Also, you should be aware of a point estimate. Point estimate, this is a statistic that is calculated from a sample data and serves as a, the best guess of a known population parameter. As a statistic that is calculated from a sample data that will serve as a best guess of a known population, a known population, a known population parameter. So that is what we call a point, a point estimate. So allow me to go back to what you were talking about earlier on population and a sample. Here is a small example that will help us to know more on the difference between a sample and a population. So for example, you can consider a, 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 a case whereby we are determining the literacy level for citizens in Rwanda. In this example, you find that it is difficult to get information from the whole population or from the, from the whole citizens of Rwanda concerning their literacy level. But you can decide to take a survey or to take a, a sample from the whole city, number of citizens or from the whole population and you can use, for example, a thousand individuals. So you can interview a thousand individuals. You then from there you can determine the level of literacy of the all all citizens of Rwanda. That is an example of a population and a sample. So a sample is a thousand individuals whom you will interview here, and the whole population or the all citizens of Rwanda will be our population. And, and the example here that will help us to know more on sample and the population. Uh, for example, you are you want to determine the number of students in a particular college that, for example, are doing a particular are interested in, in football or in soccer. It will be difficult to get information from every student in that college regarding their preference to soccer 
So you can, but you can, you can get information from 300 students. You can interview 300 students and you get their, their preference to soccer. So 300 students in our cases are sample and the all students in that college, that one is our population. And the example is whereby you want to determine the, uh, the number of opinion, opinion of voters in Rwanda, registered voters. In our case, when you sample a thousand voters or you use a thousand voters to get the opinions, so a thousand shall be our sample. And the all registered voters in our case are, is our population. Our last example, you can decide to get the tax information for a certain or for, for the whole population. Since it is difficult to, to interview each and every individual, asking them how do you pay your tax, don't you pay your tax, the reasons why you don't pay your tax, you see, it shall be hectic to interview a whole population of one, but you can decide to interview 2,000, 2,000 residents. So the 2,000 residents will give you the tax information in our case. That is our sample. And the all citizens in Rwanda who pay taxes, that is our, that's our population. That shall be our population. So let us go ahead and define two terms which we shall be encountering. The first term is a parameter and a statistic. So a parameter is any statistical constant of a population. In simple terms, a parameter is a numerical number of the population. For example, you can have population mean, population variance, population standard deviation. While a statistic is a function of the sample. For example, you can have a sample mean, sample variance, sample standard deviation. Both statistic and parameters just gives us summaries of measurable characteristics of the population. For example, we are dealing with a categorical variable, e.g., level of education. The most common statistic or parameter here is the proportion. While when dealing with the numeric variables, the statistic or parameter here, for example, when you are dealing with the height in this numeric variable, the height, the, the most uh, common statistic or parameter here is the mean, the standard deviation. So those are the terms you should be aware of when you are talking about the parameter about the statistics. In terms of the simple that we use, uh, when you're dealing with a sample or a population, for example, uh, when you have the proportion, proportion in the sample is denoted as pi, pi hat. That is the proportion. And the population, proportion is is just denoted as pi. When you are dealing with the mean, mean in a sample is just denoted as x bar, that is the mean, while the, the in population is just denoted as the mu. So we should be aware of those signs for proportion, the mean. Standard deviation as a sample is just denoted as s, which is Latin letter s while in the population is denoted as sigma, yeah, sigma. And lastly, variance. Variance is denoted as S squared, which is the square of the standard deviation, you get the variance. And in the population, variance is denoted as sigma, sigma squared. So sigma squared, is the population. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and, and tackle another topic here in random sampling. 
and random sampling is a part of the sampling technique in which each sample has equal opportunity and chances of being chosen. So in random sampling, each part of the sampling technique in, in which each sample has equal opportunity and chances of being chosen. That is random sampling. And randomization process is a sample selection. In sample selection helps to avoid preferential treatment in selection that brings about selectivity bias. So a random sample is unbiased. In this method, the researcher has no freedom to select some units from the group, but certain methods helps in selection of the units. So subjects in this process are sampled by random process using either random number generator or a random table generator, a random table, I mean. So mostly in random sampling, we should be aware of is that uh, the researcher has no freedom to, to select a, a certain characteristics of units, but they, it is generated using either a random table, random generator, things like that. That's what you have to know in random sampling. For example, consider uh, rolling a dice whereby we are betting with a friend about possibility of getting either one, two, three, four, five, or six. So we want to know if the dice is unbiased. The logical approach here is to roll the dice enough times to get an approximate value of the probability of getting any number from one to six. So you roll these dice enough times. There's no specific number of times you're gonna roll it, but you can roll it enough times from there, you can be able to determine the probability of either getting one, two, three, four, five, or six. So we have to choose a sample representative from the whole population. All population, I e what is enough in our example? You have just said enough times. So what is enough here? You can say you want to roll it four times, five times, six times. Yeah? That is a sample representative from the whole population. Then cost and times are important factor in constraining the choice of a sample size. So you know, cost and time. How long are you going to spend collecting the sample? That is, will act as a factor in constraining the choice of a sample size. Also the, the cost. Eh? How much are you going to spend? How much are you going to spend for the sample size you are selecting? So that will act as a factor also in, in constraining. Then you have types of random sampling. Types of random sampling. Random sampling is useful because observations are independent from each other. And with these types of random sampling, uh, we, we shall just discuss a few of them. You have simple random sampling. You have stratified random sampling. You have cluster random sampling. You have systematic, systematic random sampling. Okay. So what is a simple random sampling? What is a simple random sampling? So in simple random sampling, N objects are drawn at random from a population. So you draw n, n objects eh, from a random population. A sample with the n members is a simple random sampling. So sample, if you have selected your sample so that every possible different group of n members have equal chances of being chosen. So every member in that sample you have chosen has equal opportunity or equal chances of being chosen. That now is what we call simple random sampling, simple random sampling. Every member has equal chances of being chosen eh? from the, that sample. Then we call that simple, simple random sampling. Another example of random sampling is stratified random sampling, stratified random sampling. 
when this type of random sampling always starts off by dividing dividing a population into groups, and these groups you call them strata, huh? and every strata has similar attribute. Huh? Every strata, every group has a similar attribute. Then a random sample is taken from each group. After you have divided the all the all population into groups, which we call strata, then from that group we take a sample. Huh? You take a sample, a sample from that group. That is what we call stratified random sampling. So this ensures that all the different segments in the population are equally represented. Every group or every segment is equally represented. So consider an example whereby a sample of 2,000 people are selected for a particular study. You have selected 2,000 people and you are want to conduct a particular study, then the 2,000 persons can be divided into strata according to age. So 2,000 people, you have selected a sample of 2,000 people, you can choose to divide this group into strata huh? according to their age groups. So you can just say you want to collect data uh, from those 2,000 people, the age of from 18 to 29, you want to know uh, the, the 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 qualities or the representation of the age group from 18 to 29, from 30 to 39, from 40 to 49, from 50 to 59, and then you can uh, uh, summarize it by ending at 60 and above, eh? the population from 60 and above. So this representation from 18 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59 and 60 and above, that is what we call strata. Mm -hmm. So each strata will then have unique members and number of members. So you get that from 80 to 29, you have the, the, the qualities you're gonna find there are unique from those of 30 to 39 and up to 60 and above. You'll find that the, the number, even the number, the, the size from 18 to 29, when you compare them with 50 to 59 or 60 and above, you find that they are unique. So they are unique and they are also of different, different numbers. That's what we call stratified huh? random sampling. Okay. So another, another example, uh, random sampling technique here that most strata use is called the cluster sampling. In cases where survey area is too large and the population is dispersed, that's when uh, you'll find some will consider using cluster random sampling. When the, the all population is very large and it is so much dispersed or cluster sampling will be used. Yeah. And the objective is to choose a limited number of smaller geographical areas in which simple or systematic random sample can be conducted. So you choose a limited number of smaller geographic areas in which simple or systematic random sample can be conducted. So very often it is completed in two stages. In stage one, you'll find a random, sele random selection of clusters. So you select clusters. The entire population of interest is divided into smaller distinct geographical areas such as villages, camps, etc. So you have said that in Class, considering using cluster random sampling is when the population is very large and dispersed. So you can find that some people desire to use a geographical area such as a village, okay? A village, then from that village, you find the, the, the qualities in that village or the representation of that village. You then need to find the approximate size of population for each village. Here, the primary sampling unit is the village, yeah? the primary random sampling unit is the village. So clusters are then assigned randomly to the villages. So you assign clusters randomly to the villages, okay? Then stage number two, there's random selection of households within each clusters using simple or systematic random sampling, okay? I said stage number two, random selection of household within each cluster 
using simple or systematic random sampling. So each village is a cluster. So you can collect household information from every, every village that you have selected using either simple or systematic or systematic random sampling. That's what we call, let us go ahead and look on another type of sampling. Type of sampling. This type we call it systematic sampling. And in systematic sampling, this method involves selecting a sample and you place it on a regular interval. Rather than using a specific random selection, here we use a regular interval. For example, you can put a population in a list and you decide to select every third member from that list until you have acquired the desired sample size. So when you select every third member, third member, until you reach the required sample size, that's what we call systematic sampling. So biasing in this type of sampling can be prevented by choosing to use randomization in the starting place of the sampling list. So when you use randomization, this will help us to, be, to prevent bias in this type of systematic sampling. So you have a small formula here. This formula will help us to calculate the systematic sampling in double. And our formula is given by uh, K equals to capital N of a small n, where our capital N is the population size and our small n is the sample size. So in simple terms, what I mean is that systematic sampling interval is given by taking the population size over the sample and sample size. So the population size of a sample size will give us the, the sampling interval that you want, want to use. So for why a uh, number observation uh, denoted by yi uh, and the distribution of yi is the same. And what I mean by being the same is that when you take the values of yi, whereby i ranges from y from one all the way to n, and yi is independently distributed of y2, and even y2 is independently distributed of y3, and y3 is independently distributed of y4 all the way to n, and where n is the sample size you are using, that's what we call IID, or, or in simple terms, independent and identically, identically distributed. So we can consider an example of rolling a dice. We want to roll a dice two times, and we want, we want to determine if the sum, if the sum of the numbers that you have drawn, if they are, are random or not, okay? So these two numbers, they are independent. Yeah? Independent draws. The draws are independent and you are rolling it two times. We want to know or determine if the sum is random or not. So I have a small code here, just a small code in R. I think by now you know how to open R, how to run a simple code in R. And this one is just a simple code. We want to run it in R. Okay, where sum equals to sample. Yeah? Remember, you are, it's a sample. So from one all the way to six. And our dice has six faces. So phase one, phase two, phase three, four, five, and six. So from one all the way to six. And since we are rolling it, we are rolling it two times. Huh? Two times. And we replace uh, equals to true. So we say we are uh, we are sampling with replacement. Sampling with replacement. So let us just do it in R. Yeah, share my app. Open a new file. Open R script. Okay. 
So here you can see that sample from one all the way to six replacement is true. If you are with me, you can try and run it in R. Okay. You can see that it is eight. The first summation is eight. Yeah. Let me add here with the replacement. But we are going to do it without replacement to see what we we'll get. So our first sum here is eight. When we run the second time, we get we get seven. Okay. With that third time we get eight. Fourth time eight. Fifth three. You see five. So it means the summation. This one we were calling it S. Yeah? We are calling it S. Let me just say S. S1, okay? So S1 here, S1, okay? When we run this one, that's what we get. We get that the, even the summations are, they are random. Let us try and run without some, without replacement. Some, some without replacement. 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 Please try and run here. And as you see, if you will get a still a random, the summation is random. Here we call it S2. And here replacement, because it is without replacement, here replacement is say false. Okay? Say without replacement. Then from here, you can see that our first summation is seven. When we click the second time, seven. Seven. I'm sorry, I'll do, I'll be changing it. I'll be changing it here. Let's say, call it curricular system. You can distinguish. Okay, three, you see? Mm, still the same thing, the same thing. Then I call it here the score. When you run the score, you find you get the sum is nine. You see? So we can see that even when we do it with replace without replacement, when we do it without replacement. The summation is also a random variable. You can see when we did it the replacement, the first summation here we got eight, seven, the third eight, the fourth eight, then we got three, or three, we got five. You see, so you can see that the summation with the replacement is a random. Okay? It's a random variable. And when we do it, even without replacement, without replacement, when we do it without replacement, we got our first variable as seven, 
six, seven. Our third one, we got three, then nine, you see? So it means that when we do it with, with or without replacement, when we do it with or without replacement, the summation of our sample size is also a random, it's also a random variable. Let me go back here. It's also a random variable. So let us look on a sample average, sample average. So in most econometric data, we deal with average of the sample data. In this case, dealing with the average of the sample data is, is, is since we assume that the population we are dealing with is large, okay? The population is large, the population is, uh, is unknown, okay? The population is unknown, the population is also large. So we deal with sampled data. Remember when we talked about sampled data and the population data. So in our assumption here is that the, the data we are dealing with is large and of unknown population. That's why we deal here with average sum of the sample data because it, is, it shall be difficult for us to know the exact average of the population data since the, we assume that it is large and of an unknown population. So from the example of the sample function we have just did in R, okay, where the function we call it S. So when you're computing an average of the sample, as the effect that the average is a random variable itself, okay? So the average is a random variable itself. Remember when we talked, when we, we executed the code of, for the sample of the sum, we found that it is a random variable. So even here for the sample average, we consider it to be a random variable, a random variable itself. So this random variable in itself has a probability distribution and we call it the sampling distribution, okay? So the sample average of a sample of N observation, the sample average for a sample of N observation is given by this formula, whereby our Y bar, where the Y, the y observation now are up to N, N observations. So our Y bar is equal to one over N summations of the Ys, okay? For the y first observation, second, third, till y equals to n. So when you execute the observe the summations, I mean, divide it by the sample size. That one will give us the sample, sample mean or the sample average. So the sample mean is given as y bar. Okay, sample average given as the y bar, and this is the formula. Okay, you have to take this formula into consideration because you shall be required to use it somewhere, somewhere else. So let us go now to look on a sample variance. Okay, before sample variance, let us talk about the mean of the sample mean, okay? So suppose that the Y1 all the way to N, they are IID, okay? Yeah, they are independent and identically distributed, okay? Independent and identically distributed. So the, the mu y is the mean and the sigma squared y is the variance, okay? So the expectation of the mean, expectation of the mean, yeah, expectation of y bar, we calculate it by, yeah, okay, expectation of, uh, summations of all y's, okay? Summation of all y's from i equals to one all the way to n, remember? So when we execute it, when we calculate it, we will find that y one over n, where n is the sample size, times the expectation of the summations of all y's, okay? Which, whereby the y's are random variables, okay? So we will find that the n, which is one over n times n here, okay? Because there are n times, n times, okay? Observations are n up to n times. 
okay? So you'll find that our N will cancel. Now we'll get now our expectation of the mean to be the mu, mu y, okay? So the mu y is the expectation, expectation of the camp on mean, okay? Expectation. So let us go to variance, variance of sample mean, okay? So variance of sample mean, our formula is given by taking one of a sample size squared summation of the summation of the covariances of y, i, and y, j. But we know that covariance of y, i, and y, j is equal to zero. Hmm? So since the covariance is equal to, to zero, this one is due to ind in independence. Since the covariance is equal to zero, it means that this value here equals to zero. So the summation here will cancel. So when the summation here cancels, we'll find that now the variance of the sample mean is given as the sigma squared y bar. Sigma squared y bar. And this y bar, since y divided by n is still the mean. So y over n is the y bar now. So sigma squared y bar is the variance, okay? Is the variance. We can get the standard deviation of the sample mean. Okay, and the standard deviation of the sample mean is given by taking the, the square root of the variance. So the standard deviation is given by square root of the variance. So when we square the variance, and remember variance is sigma squared y bar. So when we square it, the square, I mean, the square root, we'll find that the square root here, uh, you will find that it is sigma, okay? Sigma, then the square root of y bar here. So the square root here is given by, you will, when you simplify it, you'll find that the standard deviation is given by sigma, sigma y over the square root of n. So it's, the standard deviation is given by the sigma y over the square root of the sample, sample size, by the square root of the, So we can go ahead and compute sample mean. Now we can compute it using R, R programming. As we all know, like I said earlier, in our course here, we shall be using R programming mostly. And recall we talked about small n and capital N, where we talked about sample mean and the population, okay? So for sample mean, we use uh, oh, sorry, not sample mean, but sample size, we use small n. Small n is for sample size, capital N is for population, okay? Yeah. So the number of sample size to be drawn, we shall represent it by rep. That's called rep. You can call it any other word, name you want, but we shall call it rep. And in R mostly, we have a function called replicate, replicate. So this function in R is used in conjunction with R norm. So we know that our data is from a normal distribution. So if our data is from a normal distribution, we shall use a function called R norm. And this function will help us to draw n observations from the standard normal distribution, okay? So the outcome of the replicate the outcome of the replicate, this replicate here, is a matrix, and this matrix is a dimension n by rep, okay? n, which is the sample size, and rep, which is the number of sample size to be drawn. So that one is a matrix, and this matrix is a column, is a column matrix, okay? So in R, we have a function called, called means. This function is used to compute the mean. Remember, we have said that here, our matrix is a column matrix. So, all means will help us to draw or to compute the means for each column, called means. So, we shall use called means in R to help us to draw or to compute the mean for each, 
for each column. So let's go ahead in R. Just take your time and try to write this code down because we want now to do it practically so that we can have a view of how we can compute it using R. Just try and write this code down. We have said that our n is the sample size. So our sample size here, we assume it is 10. We shall use a sample size of 10. And the number of sample size to be drawn is 10,000, okay? 10,000. So we can perform a random sampling using, just call our, our random sampling, or a, we just call it samples, okay? So samples replicate. Remember, I have talked about this function replicate. So replicate helps us to compute now the column matrix, okay? Whereby reps this number of times, okay? The number of sample size to be drawn. This is reps then because we are assuming that our data is from a normal distribution, we shall use a function R norm, okay? And our R norm is for N size, which is the sample size, which is 10, okay? So this one, this, this function here or this code here will help us to compute a matrix. And this sample matrix is 10 by 10,000, okay? 10 by 10 by 10,000. We can just, I hope you have finished writing till this point. Just take your time, okay? You can, all, you can even take your time and just write. But allow me to go straight to R. How can we compute? How can we compute our code using? How can we compute using R? Okay. So you have talked about sample size, sample size, and our sample size. We are using a sample size of ten. Okay. And the number of sample size to be drawn number of sample size sample size to be drawn number of sample size to be drawn for our case we said we are going to call it reps so the number of sample size to be drawn we said we are going to take 10 10000 okay you can go ahead and now compute a random sample. Random sample. You can compute a random computer random sample from the information we have above. You can call it samples. Samples. Remember, we talked about replicates. Replicates. So replicates will help us to get the column matrix, okay? So replicate, remember reps, is, which is the number of times, in our case is 10,000. Because our data is from a normal distribution, we we'll use R norm and N which is our sample, sample size. Remember we said this one, we shall give us 10 by, 10 by, correct, 10 by 10,000 sample matrix. And remember this sample matrix of ours is a column, is a column, is a column matrix. So let's go ahead and compute now, computing a sample average. Computing a sample average. So we can just call a sample average, we call it sample sample, call it sample like that one, um, as a sample average. Remember I've talked about call means, okay? So call means helps us to determine or to compute the mean for each columns. Remember I have said that our random sample here is a column matrix, so we can use we can be able to compute now this, the average for each column. In our case, the average we are going to use call means, call means. 
So call means, call means here, then we use call means for samples, okay? Call means for samples. We can go ahead also, we can go ahead also and determine now if, if the call means is an is a vector okay we can determine if it's a vector we just just write is okay is the sample average average a vector okay is the sample average a vector and we can determine that using a function we call it using a function in r we call it is vector is vector so is vector is vector for sample average okay this one is going to help us to know if the sample average is a vector okay it should be able to return either false or true if it is false, it means that our sample average is not a vector. If it is true, it means that our sample average is a, is a vector. Okay, so let us try and run all of this code till this point here. Okay, you see? We saw we are able to determine that our sample average, after we have run that, it is a vector, you see? It has returned true. True means that it is a vector, okay? We can also, uh, you know, we, we have just been able to determine if it's a vector, but we have not seen the data now. We can ask R to display for us the first row for, the first row for our sample average here. Remember, it is 10 by 10,000. So if if it is if it displays the all of this data, it is very large, okay? We can just tell R to display for us the first row, the first row for our sample average, okay? Okay, first row. First row for our, for the sample average. For the sample average, first row for the sample average. Okay. So first row we just use head. Okay. So this function in R will help us to to see the the head. Okay. The first row, the first row for the average, and then we say sample average. Okay. You see, so this is now our, the first row for our average. This is the first row for our average. This is the first row for our average. This is the first row for our average. We can go ahead. Let me take you back. Let me take you back to, back on our what? Where we were. Okay, this is our code. As you can see, this is the first row. I hope you had written till this point. We want to also plot a density, density histogram. We want to plot a density histogram. And this is the code for the density histogram. We can still run the same in R, okay? Density histogram, we can run it in R. We can still run it in R. Let's go ahead and run it in R, okay? Can run it in R. You can see? So this one will help us to plot the density histogram, whereby hist, the hist function, hist function in R is for histogram. Hist function is for histogram. Then the sample average, which we had computed earlier, the y limb is for the limit, okay? The y, the y axis, the limit from zero to 1.4. That's what we have chosen for hours. 
Then the color now for our histogram, we have chosen still blue. You can change any other color you want, okay? Then we want the frequencies. The frequency is false, okay, we don't want the frequencies. Then the breaks, we want 20 breaks, okay? In our data, so you can just run this. You can just run this. Okay, so you see now, this is our histogram for our sample average. This is our histogram for our sample, for our sample average. You can see that a great histogram here, our density, we used density. Remember we said that it's from zero to 1.4, you can see the y-axis, okay? Then the breaks, we said we need 20, okay, 20 breaks, okay? So you can see how we have been able to plot the sample average in using R. We can still go ahead and compute the compute now the normal curve. We want to draw a normal curve for this data here. Remember we said that we are using a normal distribution or our data is from a normal distribution. So when the data is from a normal distribution, we expect we, to have a normal curve here. We expect to have a normal curve. Then we can compute a normal curve by using the curve function, okay? After you have done the hist, you can use curve. As you can see, curve, curve then the norm, okay? For normal, then you have x, okay? Which is the sample, sample average, okay? Then the standard deviation is one of a square root of the sample size. And the square root of sample size is 10. Then our color, we want the, our normal curve to be red. So we, we take color, the color to be red, okay? This is the density that you want, then you can go ahead and just run the same. You see? So this is now our normal curve for the histogram. So the density histogram is now as shown, okay? This one is our histogram, our histogram for our sample average. This is our histogram for our sample, for our sample average. Let's go, let's go back here. So you can just take your time, take your time and write this, try to, to play with these codes here. You can even choose a sample size of more than 10. You can just say you want to use 100. You can use 100. Then the number of sample sizes that you want, you can use the same that you want. But the sample size, this is the code for it, okay? The replicate, the reps, okay? It depends on the name you have given above there. Then from our, a normal distribution, our n, which is our sample size, go ahead and compute the sample average using our function, which is called means. So called means will help us to compute the sample average for the columns, okay? We can determine if, if we can take if the sample mean is a vector using its vector function. So its vector function will give us either true or false. True if it is a vector, false if it is not a vector, it's not a vector. You can go ahead and view the first row, okay? For the sample average, you can go ahead and plot now the density histogram using the hist function, you can now overlay the, the sample average, okay, the distribution on top of the histogram using the curve, the curve function. Okay, so I hope until this point you can be able to run a simple, a simple code in R to compute a mean. This is just a simple code. You can be able to run it in R you can be able to run it in R. So take your time, take your time and compute it. And we can go ahead to our next, to our next, our next lesson on the same. So 
Let us talk about finite and large sample properties of estimators. Finite and large sample properties of estimators. And you have two properties of estimators. The properties of estimators, number one, you have the finite sample properties and large sample properties, okay? So finite sample properties and large sample properties. So these estimates, the point estimate is a statistic which is calculated from a sample data. And this data serves as a best guess of our known parameter, okay? Serves as a, a right a guess for our unknown population, population parameter. So let us talk about the finite sample properties. Under the finite sample properties, finite sample properties for n finite number of observation, for n finite number of observation, we consider an estimator whereby you can give that estimator W and our parameter is theta. So our criteria of evaluation is such that for bias, we consider if the expectation of W, which is our estimator, is equal to theta, which is our parameter, okay? So we consider bias and variance. And because here it is a finite sample properties, now for variance, is we, we ask ourselves, do we like an estimator with a small variance? Okay, so if it is an estimate of a small variance, then that is a finite sample properties. Okay, so example, uh, consider values of X, whereby X ranges from X1 all the way to Xn, and those values are I, ID, okay? They are independent and ident identically distributed with the mean of mu and variance sigma squared, okay? So the unknown parameters are mu and sigma squared. So the mu is the uh, the mean and sigma squared is the, is the variance. Okay, so this estimate of mu or estimate, estimate of the mean is found by taking the summation of all the xi divided by the total sample size, okay? So the, uh, you take the summation of all xi's divided by the, the sample size of which is n. And now that is the estimate for the, for the mu or the estimate of the mean, okay? And for the estimate of sigma squared, which is variance, sigma, sigma squared is of which is variance, we get the estimate by taking all the summation of xi minus, minus the, the mean, okay? Minus the mean x, x bar n is the mean, okay? So the square root of xi minus x, x by n, the square root will give us now the estimate of sigma squared. So the estimate of variance, we find it by taking summation of all xi minus the mean n divided by the sample size. That is the estimate of sigma squared. Now our bias, we get our bias by taking the estimate of the mean, which is mu, okay? Mu, the estimate, the bias is the estimate of the mu n, which is given by one over the sample size. We take that sample size multiplied by the mu, which is the mean. When we get, uh, we get the value as mu, we can say that it is, it is unbiased, okay? It's unbiased. And the variance now, the variance of the mean of the mu n, mu n, estimate of the mu, which we, we, we other times is just the mean, okay? We, we get the variance by taking one over the uh, sample size squared, multiplied by the sample size sigma, sigma squared. When you compute those calculations, you find that now the variance, the variance of the mean is given by one over n sigma sigma squared. That is the variance. So we go ahead and compute the expectation of expectation of variance. After we have found here the variance, we calculate the expectation of variance by taking one over the summation of all xi minus the mean mean of x. Then you square you square them. Okay. 
you square them, you divide by the sample size n. When you compute the, math, the, the this math, mathematic function here, we will get that one over n multiplied by the summation of expected expectation of x i squared minus two expectation of x i multiplied by the mean n plus expectation of the mean squared. Okay. In other terms, you just complete this eh, this formula here. Okay. When you expand this function, you will find that it is, you can write this, it like this, okay? When you expand this one, you find that you can write it like this. So when you continue to expand it, you find that one over n multiplied by the n uh, sample size, multiplied by the mu squared plus sigma squared minus two mu squared plus sigma squared over n plus sigma squared over n plus sigma squared, then when it, you simplify it, that you find that n minus one over n sigma squared, okay? Hence it is, it's bias. It is bias. So in your, in your own time, you can just take uh, time and you can begin from this point, taking all your time, try to compute, to find uh, this expression. So at the end of the day, you find that n minus one over n sigma squared is the expectation of the sigma squared. Okay. So it means that this it is bias. So we want to fix bias. Okay. We want to fix this bias. For us to fix this bias, you consider something that uh, s squared over n equals to one over n minus one, summation of all x i minus x, x bar n squared, okay? And when we complete that, we'll just do the same thing we have done here. When we complete that, we'll find that the expectation of s squared n is equal to the sigma, sigma squared, okay? Sigma, sigma squared, which is now, it is now, it is now unbiased, okay? It is now unbiased. Let us go ahead and, and look at large sample properties. Large sample properties, we have just talked about the finite sample properties as properties of point estimate. So for the law of large numbers states that for a large sample, okay, you, you you do a more research on the law of large numbers, but this law states that for large sample of the y bar is always close to the mu of y, okay, with a high probability. And when we talk about the central limit theorem, this theorem states that assembly distribution of any standardized sample average, okay, for example, when you take the y bar minus mu bar, uh, multiplying it by the sigma y bar, sigma y, sorry, you'll find that it's a small asymptotically normally distributed. When we talk about asymptotic distribution, this is whereby as n tends to infinity, okay? As n tends to infinity, the sample approximation becomes exact, okay? So when n tends to infinity, the sample approximation will, will become or becomes exact, okay? When the sample size, remember this n is sample size, when it tends to infinity, always the approximation, sample approximation will tend to be, to be exact. So the probability of obtaining a sample of, a sample average y bar that is close to is high if you have a large sample size, okay? is high, is high if you have a high sample size. Okay, so let us talk another uh, topic here of hypothesis testing, hypothesis testing. So any research is not complete without a hypothesis. Now, when we talk about hypothesis, what we mean is just a claim or assumption, okay? 
So it's a claim about a population parameter. And this population parameter can be, for example, the mean, okay, or the proportion, the standard deviation. And this assumption is that this it is a postulated or stipulated value of a parameter. Okay. So for example, let's talk about uh, the mean monthly cell phone bill in Kigali. Okay in Kigali, Rwanda, and uh, we can assume that, uh, when we talk about assume, that's now what we say, we mean by hypothesis. So assume that our me mean, okay, the mean cell phone bill, the mean cell phone bill is at $42, okay? So this $42 monthly cell phone bill, and the proportion of adults in this city Okay, the number of adults which have cell phones, you can give it a value of pi, and this pi, let's say it is 0 0.68. Okay, a proportion, the proportion of adults in the city who have or who own cell phones. On the basis of observation, on the basis of observation of the data, one then can perform a test to decide whether the, post, the postulated hypothesis should be accepted or not, okay? So we want to do a test to determine that if it is indeed this claim is true, that a claim that the main monthly cell phone bill is $42, where the proportion for adults in that uh, city of Kigali is 0 0.68. So you have to do a test to determine if this claim is true, okay? if this claim is true. That's what we call hypothesis, hypothesis testing. So we have types of hypothesis, and mostly we have two types of hypothesis. And these types, we have the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis, we denote it by H naught, okay? H naught, okay? the null hypothesis, H0 or HO. And the alternative hypothesis we denote it by H1, okay? H1. This is the alternative, alternative hypothesis. So take note of the, of the sub, subscript, okay? Zero and one, meaning that this one is a null hypothesis and this one is the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis, and an alternative hypothesis, these are just statements about the population, okay? These are just statements about the population. And this statement on the population parameters ex expresses different possible characterization of the population. And this population can correspond to different scientific hypotheses, okay? That's what we talk about, we call the null and the alternative hypothesis. We shall be learning more on the null hypothesis we shall be knowing how how can we say how do we know that we go with the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis what do we mean when we say that we reject the alternative hypothesis or we accept the alternative, alternative hypothesis so go with me go with me let us talk about the null, null hypothesis okay the null hypothesis the null hypothesis like i've said before is we represent it by H, H naught, okay? And H naught or this subscript is zero, okay? So we usually read it as H zero. You can read it as H zero or H naught. Any of those terms are acceptable, okay? So for example, let's uh, look uh, uh, on a case whereby you have two treatment group cases, okay? The usual null hypothesis is that the population means are equal. The population means are equal, usually written as H naught, okay? H naught, remember in our Kigali example, we used the mean mu to represent the mean, okay? So for example here, since we are talking about two population means, then we can talk about the population mean one, which is mean one and mean two, okay? This is mean one and mean two. So these are just the two hypotheses for the means. 
This is the hypothesis to be actually tested for acceptance or rejection. When we talk about the null hypothesis, usually we either reject or accept the null hypothesis. That's all we, we, we talk about when dealing with the null hypothesis, okay? This is the acceptable hypothesis whereby you have to make a judgment from the test you have done, either you want to accept it or to reject it. And this original claim includes equalities. When we, we, when we are describing the, the no, uh, null hypothesis, we use inequalities like uh, less than, equal to, or equal to, or greater than, equal to. So whenever you find these inequalities, know that you are dealing with a null hypothesis. Whenever you find these uh, uh, inequalities, just know that you are dealing with a null hypothesis. So, so note that a hypothesis always include a sign, okay? An equal sign. A null hypothesis will always include an equal sign. Whenever you see an equal sign, know that you are dealing with a null hypothesis. And the decision is always based on the null hypothesis. After you have done the test, the decision of either rejecting or accepting a particular test, you always base it on the null hypothesis, okay? Always based on the null hypothesis. So let us go back to the example of our monthly cell phone bill in Kigali. And we found that uh, the claim was that the mean monthly bill is $42, okay? So now this one, is our null hypothesis. So H naught mu equals to 42. This one is our null hypothesis. This one is our null, our null hypothesis. Let's look on another type of hypothesis. And this hypothesis, we call it the alternative hypothesis. In this case, we denote it by H1. We have to map this, but the alternative hypothesis is denoted by H1, unlike the null hypothesis where we denoted it by H0, this one is denoted by H1. And this is a statement that is true if the null hypothesis is false. So when we reject the null hypothesis, we accept the alternative hypothesis. For example, we can look at this claim, mostly uh, in a two treatment group case, such that two population means are unequal, okay? So we can write the alternative hypothesis for two means of populations that are unequal by H1, mu one is not equal to mu two. So this statement means that the means are unequal. Alternative hypothesis covers conditions with less than, greater than, or equal to. Unlike the null hypothesis, if I can just go back to that case, whereby we denoted, uh, the, we used equalities like uh, less than or equal to, equal to, greater than or equal to. Remember we said that for a null hypothesis, we always include an equal sign. That is for null hypothesis. But now for our alternative hypothesis, we don't include an equal sign. So alternative hypothesis, we can use less than, greater than, or not equal to. So that is the conditions that we use when we are referring to alternative hypothesis. Let's look at the hypothesis testing process. Hypothesis testing process. Remember our example, that one for Kigali, where we, we, we talked about we talked about the mean monthly cell phone bill in Kigali is equal to $42. That was our claim. Our claim was that the mean monthly cell phone bill in Kigali is equal to $42. $42. So now for our hypothesis testing process, the claim is that the mean monthly cell phone bill in Kigali is $42. I.e. now, our null hypothesis is that the mean, which is mu equals to 42, that is the mean, okay? Mean equals to 42. This, this case is for the 
null hypothesis. And uh, our alternative hypothesis is that our means, okay, the mean is not equal to 42. The mean is not equal to 42. Remember the, the conditions we, we said we shall be using for null hypothesis. We said that for a null hypothesis, it must include an equal sign. So the mean, which is mu equals to 42, and for alternative hypothesis, we say that it not have an equal sign. So the mule is not equal to not equal to 42. So the sample population, the sample population, and find the population mean. So the population we have to, the process is that first you have to sample the population. Okay, you sample the population for all the Kigali. And then we find the population mean for that population. So suppose the sample mean B was, the sample mean was that it is, uh, the X by now is 20, $20, assuming that is our sample mean. This is significantly lower than the claim mean, mean bill of 42. So if we sample and we find that the, the mean, the sample mean is $20, you find that this twenty dollars is slightly or significantly lower than the, our claim here of the mean of forty-two. Okay, so now if the null hypothesis were true, the probability of getting such a different sample mean would be very small. If the null hypothesis was true, okay, remember the null hypothesis that H not mu or, or the mean is equal to forty-two. If the sample mean were true, the probability of getting such a different sample mean will be very small. So you reject the null hypothesis. You reject null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is rejected if the probability, if, if after finding that the probability of getting such a different sample mean is small. Because you can see that now for our X bar, after you have found the sample mean is $20 and our claim was, uh, the, the mean was 42, you see that it is significant, significantly very small. So we reject the null, the null hypothesis. So we reject the null hypothesis. So rejection and rejection and non-rejection region. The rejection and non-rejection region Remember now that uh, uh, this one being our distribution, our sampling distribution of all the sample uh, means, okay, X bar. Now, this one was our claim that the mean is equal to 42. So, if now the null hypothesis is true, here, the null hypothesis is true. Remember now, uh, we after we had sampled, we found out that the sample mean is 20. It is unlikely that you will get a sample mean of 20. It is unlikely that you will get a sample mean of 20. When, when now, now, now that our X bar lies on this further end, you reject the, the null hypothesis when the mean is equal to, the mean is equal to 42. So, when you go to this further end, you reject the null hypothesis. You reject the null hypothesis when the mean is 42. And then here, this one is our acceptance region. Okay, when in fact that this is where the true mean cell phone bill is. This center here is where now our true mean cell phone bill is. Our sampling distribution of the test statistic so this one here is our non-rejection region 